there's this balance of if you go into a point where you can only be healed with crystals, you can only get rid of negative energy with smudging, you can only rely on your tarot deck to be able to tell you what's what's coming if you're doing a good job. There's an over-reliance and almost like a bit of a bypassing because at its core fundamental for me, spirituality is about you. You have everything within you, regardless of where you, whether you realize it or not. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Remind podcast, where we combine neuroscience, spirituality, and personal development to help you heal your deepest wounds and transform your life. I'm Dr. Ash Morland. I'm joined by David Masterton. Today we are talking about genuine, authentic healing versus spiritual bypassing. Maybe you're familiar with spiritual bypassing. Maybe the concept is brand new. But really what we're going to be talking about is what happens when we are so fixated on seeking the light and the positivity and the, you know, all of those beautiful spiritual Mm. things, but actually avoiding our own darkness in the process. Yeah, or even um, just along the lines of, when you are aware of a topic or aware of a condition or aware of a or desire to be a certain way and you're feeling as though you embody it even though there might be a gap between the two and it could be anything like and and for for me i'm seeing a lot of it um spiritually that's why we've decided to talk about it in a spiritual form but it could be anything it could be like um, responsibilities i'm not arrogant like you you understand there's a desire there's all of that but then when push comes to shove, there's a, there's an arrogance. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just really being mindful of, you know, being able to hold up a mirror or allowing others to hold up a mirror to you with that. So um, great to be here, Ash. Episode, tw- episode 27. We're it's exciting, the, isn't it? Clicking <laughs> through the episodes. We're only three away from 30, yeah. if I remembered how to do my maths correctly. <laughs> So let's start with what spiritual bypassing actually means. What are we talking about? And and sometimes, I guess in the most basic way, whether we know we're doing this or not, I mean, even if you don't perceive yourself to be super spiritual, you might be demonstrating some behaviors that would be considered aligned with what spiritual bypassing actually is. So it could be something as simple as uh, using spiritual beliefs or Uh, even like toxic positivity or practices or rituals or habits as a way to avoid or bypass difficult emotions or any unresolved traumas or even like Mm. our own personal responsibilities. And the first example that comes to my mind is like when someone is experiencing massive grief and all of a sudden you get the people who turn around and say they're in a better place now or something like that where you just go, even if that's true, it completely denies the experience of human grief that I mm. need to navigate through. And that is just like one really basic example that was just top of my mind as I was speaking then. But what's been your experience of this, Dave? How have you seen this show up in your own life, in mm. you know, observing it in others? Well, in, in myself, um, full stop. So, um, being a bit of a spiritual guy, uh, love me some crystals, love me some sage to smudge, do believe in the, um, the concept of karma and that, um, you know, things are meant to happen for me as opposed to to me. So, all of that. And so, there's this balance of if you go into a point where you can only be healed with crystals. You can only get rid of negative energy with smudging. You can only rely on your tarot deck to be able to tell you what's what's coming if you're doing a good job. There's an over-reliance and almost like a bit of a bypassing because at its core fundamental, for me, spirituality is about you. You have everything within you regardless of where you whether you realize it or not and it's not learning how to be spiritual 
it's remembering that you are spiritual. Mm. And so when I see um, instances in others, in myself, where there's too much reliance being put on to it happen just because it's it's for me. Well, there's, yes, it's right, it's for you, but let's dig into what necessarily is for you within this lesson, within this karma. It's not just balancing out, I killed a bee, so therefore I have to take a, a smack in the head. Or, you know, I need to recharge my crystals, that's why I feel like crap. Well, there could be something else. Or that I can only be healed when I've got another spiritual healer coming at me and healing me for me. Mm. And so when you when when someone else is healing you, what they're doing is they're presenting the energy for you to take what you need from it. Yeah. Because healing is very much w- w- within. So where I'm seeing it at the moment, and this is actually a big lesson for me, is that when I'm seeing something and it's being presented a lot, it's normally mirroring something I need to look back at myself for. <laughs> yes. And it's one so of the these, f- isn't it? For every finger pointing out, there's three pointing back at you. <laughs> Absolutely. So there's this really big thing for the last couple of months with me. I'm seeing a lot of spiritual bypassing and I'm getting irritated and I'm, I'm getting frustrated. And, I'm, and then after a little while, I started to realize, well, this is here for a reason. Yeah. And I need to look at what it is that I might be, be doing. And guess what, guys? I found some stuff that I was doing myself. And um, so the concept for me, if I had to simply put it down, to be able to bypass something, you have to be aware of it and have a desire and then have a big gap in between where you think you are and what you're actually presenting. So for me, it starts off with awareness or identification of, of something. Then it comes into understanding at a deeper level what that is, that state, that personality trait, that healed state, whatever, that vibration whatever it is, then the next level is embodiment, which is when you can take that and you can actually live it and yeah. not just be able to talk about it, but when you get poked and prodded or put in a situation where that is required, that you actually do it. Now, and, and for me, embodiment even has a couple of layers. Mm-hmm. There is the learned embodiment, which is you are doing it but you're controlling and feeling everything happening around you. It's not a natural state of embodiment, which I think is something that always has to happen first. When you first learn how to walk, you're thinking about it. There's a, when you first learn how to drive, you have to really focus on it. But then when it comes into a full natural embodiment, you can drive without even thinking about it. You can walk without even thinking about it. It's that full flow, that full state. And so, I do find that there are people that identify as embodying in whichever form it is, however, simply aware of the concept. Yeah. And so to me, the gap between those two things is the bypassing. And it can come across as someone who's not wanting to look at it, or it could be a misnomer. Mm. I don't realize I'm doing it. Cue David a couple of months ago. Yeah. And so really important to be able to look at these things and to sort of go, am I aspiring to be this or am I actually this? Yeah. And it's a, it's a really fine line. Like we've got this in the title. It's a fine line. You yeah. can send yourself absolutely crazy. Yep. Trying to constantly self-reflect and self-review to a point where you almost gaslight yourself, you know, and it can come across when you're doing it to others yep. as, as well. But at the end, for me, it's about does this sort of resonate? And if it resonates, go ahead with it. Whether you're right or wrong, there's something to be learned all the way. And you will find it because ultimately at the end of the day, it's a spiritual journey. It's a spiritual yeah. path. You're not there yet. You never will be there. There's just going to be an evolution of remembering. Yeah, a hundred percent. There's so, oh my gosh, there's so much. <laughs> Where do I even go with that? There's so much to unpack. Um, something that I think in my experience, so 
we we are really different in terms of our spiritual frame of reference. I think at the core of it, I mean, you were talking about um, that you believe everything is within us. And I've spoken really openly that my spiritual frame of reference is what I would consider spiritual Christian. Mm. And I'm really intentional about not using the word Christian because straight away the thing that people um, will often have come to their mind is almost like a hypocritical superiority complex which in and of itself the religious form of christianity that has been passed down through inferior human theology Mm. um, or misrepresented human theology is spiritual bypassing like looking believing that um you know a religion is spiritually superior and then using that belief to justify being condescending to Mm. people, being judgmental to people, Mm. being divisive, being dismissive, being attacking, unloving, Mm. completely missed the point. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that was my experience of Christianity growing up, which I absolutely like like that drove me to walk away from it all when I was 12. Mm. But having said that, I think for me, it's been a really interesting journey in navigating this because it's language right so the bible regularly i mean if you google it i'm sure that there'll be many verses that come up but it talks about that the holy spirit dwells in us Mm. and so when you say it's what's within us we have the power within us that's not me being self-righteous going i can heal myself it's There's a Holy Spirit within me that can heal me, that can guide me, that can lead me. That's my um, connection to source, connection to God, the Mm -hmm. intuition we talk about, all those things, right? Absolutely. Um, Now, the, the really interesting thing for me, especially in my line of work, something that I really need to be very conscious of and very mindful of is being, I guess, kind of triggered, not so much anymore, but to an extent triggered by people, even who would call themselves healers. Cause something that I'm really conscious of with my clients is saying, I am human, <laughs> right? Mm. The, the me that you're working with, yes, there is a spiritual element to this, but I can't heal you. I can facilitate and activate within you that direct line of communication that will result in your healing. Mm. But I'm not doing it for you. I'm not doing it to you, right? I can hold your hand. I can take you on a journey, but I can't heal you. I don't have superpowers. And something that um, when I see spiritual bypassing, especially in my line of work, is people who almost over identify with the persona of healer and Mm. the risk of that is that if someone's over identifying with the persona of healer well then sometimes they can actually use the significance that they get through healing others to avoid their own inner work to avoid their own unresolved issues their own trauma their own need for healing in the first place. Mm. And something that um, I've really been super open with, I think even in our previous episode, I was nearly at the point of tears. Um, That can, when we are spiritually bypassing, that can result in almost like a need to appear as though I've always got it together or appear as though, you know, a facade that I'm so spiritually evolved and awakened and enlightened that I am free from personal struggles and I have a perfect life. And (laughs) that in Mm. itself is spiritual bypassing. It's bypassing me exploring my own vulnerabilities and my own pain and being willing to go inwards. And actually that vulnerability and willingness to go inwards is what facilitates genuine connection with others that Mm. we seek anyway. So I just, yeah, this is so big. It it is a big one. And um, I'll I'll go back to one just sort of recently that was an aha moment. 
and it was my desire to be unflappable because when <laughs> when you when you go through and you do a lot of work nothing should be able to trigger you um this is like you know uh, an ego part of being spiritual right yeah. you've released your traumas you've released your triggers so therefore whatever happens you're unflappable and one big intention for me at this point in time a while ago was I would never make a decision out of fear again. Mm. And so um, if I felt uneasy about a decision, but it, the, my intuition's telling me this is the way I got to go, I will do it. As opposed to if the intuition comes in and says you need to do this, but there is genuine concern, there's that, that sick feeling at the pit of your stomach, but there's that actual gentle nudge that this is for you, I won't let the, the, the fear in the pit of my stomach stop me from doing it. Yeah, That was kind of the, the intention I was trying to put out there and I was priding myself on that. And I had opportunities to actually live that. Mm. As, and as terrible as it felt at the time, it was beautiful in hindsight. But then I started taking it this little extra step further. And I hadn't sort of clearly articulated what it was I was trying to trying to get. I can say it now because it's in retrospect. And I was talking with my mate Bruno. And I just sort of said to him, I'm absolutely unfuckable. And don't worry, I'll beep that out in uh, post, post-production. And I go, there's no situation you can put me in front of that will affect me. Mm. And he's, oh, mate, I, I'm a bit concerned about that. <laughs> And I go, well, why? I mean, mate, I'm, I'm doing this work. I'm releasing all of this. I haven't made any bad decisions, even though my intuition's saying I've got to go this way and I'm fearing the worst, but I'm still going through it. And he goes, but what happens if, you know, you lost your kids? I go, well, it wouldn't affect me. Mm. And at the time I'm saying it, I'm believing it. He goes, well, he goes, what about this? And I go, no, because at the time I thought to be a really strong spiritual person, you need to be devoid of this emotion <laughs> because this emotion will, will create triggers. It will create trauma. Yeah. I'm beyond that. Disregard the fact that you are mind, body, or yeah, mind, body, spirit, yep. supposedly integrated having a human experience, which involves density of emotion. Correct. <laughs> and what, what Bruno said to me at the time, he goes, I'm, I'm worried about my Dave. And I'm worried about the fact that you're dissociating. Mm. And I went, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. And then it took a little while after that discussion and then I sort of realized, yes, I was, yes, I was, yes, I was. Because I was getting too, almost too carried away with the fact that I'd put this projection that to be a highly spiritual person who has done a lot of work that should be able to sit on a podcast and talk about what they're doing you need to be this tall to get on this ride. Yeah. And I'd gotten to the point where I genuinely thought I was at that point where nothing can can flap me. But it was being open to the fact that when I shared this story or shared this with Bruno, that he then respected the relationship enough to not just sort of go, David's on another crazy spiritual rant. Yeah. Just, just he loved cue. you enough to be uncomfortable. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And from that, I then realized, oh, okay. I'm, I'm actually not there. I'm not that. But I was beating my chest thinking I, I was there. And look, thank God I'm not because it, it was really helpful to be able to look at it and go, I will feel every ounce of that emotion. Mm-hmm. I will grieve. I will do all of that. But the yeah. most important takeaway out of all of that, no one or no thing will have the power to, to sway my decision making through fear. Yeah. And so it was really interesting to go through that, that process because... Yeah. As I was seeing a lot of this spiritual bypassing around me, it really hit me when I sort of came across um, someone else. And again, I think this was another memorable learning TikTok moment that, mm-hmm. that sort of said, the stuff that you need 
to focus on will be presented to you. Yeah. And so suddenly the spiritual bypassing everywhere. And, so, and I then started and still very sensitive about the subject within myself on how I believe I'm here, but exactly where, where am I? Without yeah. trying to make myself go crazy in, in doubt. Well, because we can pull the wool over our own eyes, right? Mm. And we do that to cope. Um, I, on a number of occasions, when you're talking about emotional numbness and I guess that dissociation from emotion, in my own life, I'm reminded of uh, I had four miscarriages. And, you know, each time I didn't really miss a beat, I just got on with it. I put on mm. the happy face, um, toxic positivity. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. And... It, everything happens as it meant to and everything happens for a reason and all that sort of stuff, which to an extent I believe is absolutely true. But it didn't actually change the fact that what I, I, I lost my babies mm. I, and I never processed that. I never was present with that. And I so numbed out and robbed myself of the experience of connecting with those emotions. And I genuinely believed the BS that was coming out of my mouth. I genuinely, it was like the more I told other people trying to convince them that I was okay, was actually trying to convince me that I was okay so that I would believe the own BS I was spinning. Mm. And um, something that I realized that really caught me by surprise was when I was pregnant with my last child Elodie um I did not feel any connection to her and I think I've spoken about this in a previous episode I had no connection to her I think I got to about 22 weeks um before I did the morph scan I still didn't believe I would get a baby at the end but spiritual bypassing as opposed to authentically healing and genuinely being okay as opposed to saying I'm okay uh, saying I'm okay uh, saying I am okay <laughs> to convince myself is really, really different because the reality was when I was pregnant with her, my behaviors and emotional disconnection to her, the feeling of I'm not going to have a baby at the end anyway, not wanting to tell people about the pregnancy, all these behaviors that came about actually pointed to me very much not being okay. Mm. And I had t lied to myself for years and lied to everyone around me to say, I'm okay. No, it's fine. Everything happens for a reason because it made it easier for me. And I think also to an extent, it made it easier for me in the sense that if I wasn't okay, I didn't have, I, I didn't want to have to comfort other people who weren't okay with me not being okay. I mean, you're just still dealing with, you know, what you went through and then mm. having to, I don't know, comfort people, like as you said. And funnily enough, they're probably just, you know, wanting to comfort you and then you end up comforting them and then... Yeah. Um, it's, it's like actually really dysfunctional, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it, it, and at the crux of it is that vulnerability piece. Um, because, you know, if someone could just see you after that, look at you and just give you a hug. Yeah. Right? Everything's done. Everything's yeah. said. Right? As opposed to having to, you know, um, feel the need from their point to have to talk about it. Yeah. And to have to bring it up and to have to, you know, um, the social etiquette of we have to talk about it because I need to show that I care. Yeah. And I, can, I, and I can only do it because if I retell the story, I have to say I did this and I did that. And, da, 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 da. Um, and so it's, it's a, that's a huge other topic. It's like how to, how to, how to deal with your own grief and processing <laughs> and other people trying to help you with that grief and processing while they're going through yeah whatever this represents for for them absolutely uh on the plane on my way overseas recently i sat next to a beautiful couple they were an older couple um the lady was in her 70s and they lost their son unexpectedly and he was in his 30s and 
it was really beautiful to be able to have a conversation with them. Like it, it, it was a memorable experience. We even exchanged phone numbers and, and I believe we'll keep in touch. But it was so beautiful to hear them genuinely talk about how hard it was and how they've navigated that period because it meant that they didn't just block it out, move on, um, decide that you know they were going to be okay or whatever, but they've genuinely navigated it. And not only that, like I, I asked permission. I said, um, "Is this is it okay with you? Is are you comfortable with mm. talking about him and sharing about his life and and all that?" And we spent. I mean, this was on a long haul flight. And we spent hours, like they were showing me photos of him and it was so beautiful because you could tell there was still a real level of sadness there, even though a lot of time had passed. But it was such a human, genuine, authentic level of sadness, but they were still living their lives and they was, oh, it was honestly, I've got goosebumps thinking about it. It was mm. so beautiful because that's turning towards that darkness, that, that shadow. Um, and I think when it comes to darkness and shadows, something that always resonates for me is that it's light that creates shadow. Without light, there is only darkness. And so if we're moving towards light, we need to be willing to look at the shadows that are created as a pr product of that light. Well, I mean, let's go one step further. What's a, the what's a benefit of the darkness? <laughs> to not have to look, to not have to see. Well, the benefit there's there's growth. There's there's actually a beauty in the duality of it all. Well, and so, the, the benefit of the darkness in the presence of light is potential for growth. But when there's no light well, and just darkness, it's that's completely not well, seeing. The, the the darkness is still potential whether there's light or not. It's just what you do with it. Whether you sit in it and you let it control your life, or whether you take that and you introduce the light, the healing, the growth and use it as an opportunity to learn further. And so it's, it's, a, it's a potentiality e either, either way. Yeah. And so it's sort of knowing that, and I think you raise a really good point, that there's a, a certain sense of ego in the spiritual community which is coming up, which is the, the sense of I can't acknowledge all of these darkness or that I still have more darkness mm. and be able to talk about and help other people at the same time. Well, actually, that in itself is dangerous because you're not final. You're not a finality. You're not yeah. there yet. But what we're, what we're doing, if you resonate as being a way shower or someone who's supporting, whether you resonate as a healer or an alchemist or whatever it is that you resonate with, you're not there yet. But yeah. it doesn't mean what you've got now can't help and benefit somebody else. Yes, absolutely. And the, the dangerous part is when there's that finale, that I, final, that I am the, the. Yep. Now you're helping someone do that. You're not that. Yep. You're, only yes. that you're only that for yourself. Absolutely. And I think that's, as I mentioned earlier, for me, I am not a healer. I might be a conduit that through me, someone is healed. But I, I think about miracles, right? So prayer is a really big part of my life and I really believe miracles are normal. They happen in my mm -hmm. life regularly. I've seen my prayers answered repeatedly. But again, ego comes into that, right? Because you, you and I were having an offline chat about some stuff that had been happening in, in my personal life. And I think um, even a part of spiritual bypassing is bringing in our preconceived ideas of what an answer to a prayer should look like. How mm. should we be healed? Mm -hmm. And something I find really interesting and actually brought up a huge amount of um, doubt for me because I felt really led by God to do this work. And it casted a lot of doubt. You know, it was actually Christians I was most scared of in doing this work. Because so many people had this belief about that um, all you need is God and you shouldn't have to go on medication and you shouldn't have to see a psychologist or a therapist or get counseling or anything like that, that if you just pray, you'll be healed. If you, and if you're not, then you don't have enough faith. And, you know, I had an example of this in my own life just recently with my son. 
my son um, was struggling with nighttime bedwetting and that we'd seen all kinds of medical professionals and it was something that he would regularly ask me to pray about. And I think sometimes you can be deflated when you don't get the answer to prayer that you're hoping for. Like we would pray and then he'd wet the bed and that can be so deflating. But <laughs> recently he got a toe infection. Like how ridiculous is this, right? He got an infected ingrown toenail. Now, I have avoided antibiotics for myself and my family pretty relentlessly. I, I think he hasn't had antibiotics in about eight years. So antibiotics for me is like a life or death. If it, It's really, mm. if you're going to die, then it's serious enough for me to use them. It's a anyway. nuclear option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because they are so, so hardcore on your gut health. So On, he, on everything. Yeah. yeah, he had antibiotics. It's going to take probably 18 months to restore the, the flora in his gut because they just wipe out everything, right? Mm. So anyway, I was really down in the dumps and feeling really victimized and like, oh, this is the worst timing and so many bad things were happening all at once. And so he got this toe infection and we went to the doctors and the doctor's like, this is real, like really serious infection and he needs antibiotics. Like it, it could actually end up really bad if you don't give him antibiotics. And so she really laid down the law. So went to the pharmacy, got the antibiotics, reluctantly gave my son antibiotics and he hasn't wet the bed since. Now it turned out that, um, and the other hint of this should have been the pungent smell of that, but it turned out that he had a gut bacteria that was causing this nighttime wetting. All the other doctors don't know to look for that. They just did all the Western medicine stuff. But the antibiotics for his toe wiped, also, out, wiped out the gut bacteria, which then meant that the side effect of... <laughs> of him wetting the bed was gone and so i'm like what imagine that like what a blessing that he got that toe infection mm. i'm so grateful for the toe infection because that led to the antibiotics and the antibiotics fixed this fixed this thing that we've been praying about for two years mm. well it actually led to a doctor's visit that ash would have believed the doctor when they said we need antibiotics yeah and exactly. otherwise, if it was something minor, you would have said no. Yeah. But it, it had to be bad enough to go, <laughs> well, you either chop his toe off to stop the infection or you take antibiotics, Ash. Choose your bad. Yeah. But look and at all the other circumstances that could have led to antibiotics. Like he could have been so serious. He could have been hospitalized with something so big. And I look at that and go, oh my gosh, that's the grace of God right that? there. That exactly. is, I've got goosebumps. So when it comes to the um, expectation of what that answered prayer should look like, mm. that's ego. That is absolutely spiritual bypassing. It's using some kind of spiritual belief to be um, expectant, to put limit on a limitless God. Yeah, or to be, to be even to sort of go, I, I'm looking for help, you know. So when you sort of say from a Christian background, it's it's pray and God and the Holy Spirit from a spiritual sense, which is a bit more, you know, it doesn't have those labels. It's manifesting and source creation, all of that. That you put it out there, but then you only expect it in a certain way. So you're looking for it. And if it doesn't come in that way, mm -hmm. then you invalidate it. Yeah, it reminds um, me of the story. I think we've even shared this on here about the guy on top of a hill <laughs> in the rising floodwaters. And the floodwaters are rising, rising, rising. And he's saying, God, please rescue me, save me. And then the rowboat comes along. Hey, mate, you need help? No, God's going to save me. I'll, then the speedboat. Right. Yeah, <laughs> speedboat. No, God's going to save me. And then the freaking helicopter. No, God's going to save me. And then he dies and gets to heaven. And he's like, God, what are you doing? And he goes... I sent a rowboat, I sent a speedboat, I sent, sent a helicopter. Yeah. What more did you want? What did you expect me rescuing to look like? <laughs> yeah, e exactly. And it's when we sort of look at it and sort of go, I, I need help, but then I, from my cognitive side, can only comprehend how that help is going to look. Yes. And it might be 
you know, I need to feel abundant, so I need a million dollars. Yeah. Um, but it might come in in other ways. Mm-hmm. Um, don't get me wrong, a million dollars would help anyone feel abundant. <gasps> um, Amazing story on this. I was... <laughs> blew my mind but one of my friends um was going overseas for an extended holiday and she had set a goal of twenty five thousand dollars and she was like i need twenty five thousand dollars and we'd had conversations about oh maybe i should just sell my car because i'm not going to be using it while i'm away anyway and blah 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 and anyway to cut a long story short someone pulled out in front of her wrote her car off just before she went away the insurance claim was $25,000. Bang. <laughs> like, the, the, it doesn't matter. Leave the how, but yeah, it, yeah. It will, your prayers will be answered in, okay, so there's two aspects to this. Our previous episode talked about um, safety. Mm. There is no amount of solutions out there that would have solved my problem because I needed the problem in order to stay safe according to my previous belief system. So when it comes to healing and having prayers answered and all that kind of stuff, you need to be willing to actually receive that in order for it to manifest. Well, Want, actually, wanting it to, isn't enough. To, to go on from that, if you were, say, not feeling safe, right, and your prayers, your manifestations, putting out there was to feel safe, well, how is that going to be served up to you? It's mm-hmm. going to be served up in the in triggers. It's going to be served up in mirrors of traumas that you need to let go of. Yeah. And you're going to sit there going, I'm sorry, why are you handing me the chicken? Because I ordered the beef. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's so many stories of this that just make me laugh where I just go, oh mm. my gosh, like there was another one. Um, so there's a concept of tithing, which is around uh, 10% of your income. And someone had said, oh, you know, earning 5,000, I think it was like five grand a week or something. And they're going, I'm really struggling with the concept of tithing $500 a week because it's just so much and all of Mm. this. And now the the whole concept of this is about the posture of your heart in giving, right? And, And the generosity of spirit. And the thing that made me laugh was, so can you pray for me so that, um, I don't struggle so much with that. And the prayer was, well, what happens if you were only earning $500 a week? Would you feel more, more safe giving or more comfortable giving 50? Because would you rather earn 5,000 and give 10% of that at 500? Or would you rather earn 500 and give 50? And I just think that is so funny because that is an answered prayer. Be specific. Mm. But we can't, we can't pray for something and it be expectant that we're going to get it in a certain way and then bypass the way that it comes in the first place. Because mm. a lot or, of... Or put it down to something else. A lot of like, the times in my experience, the, th- the answer to my prayers has been in changing me, not in just giving me what I want to appease my will and ego. Well, it's, that's the answer to most things. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it's, there's unfortunately no, no shortcuts in that because what... When you look at or if you subscribe to the fact that you create your own reality, I mean, that's a that's a big stretch. And still for me, I look at that and go, hmm, am I there yet? No. Do I understand the concept? Yes. Do I believe the concept? Well, to my ability at the moment, I think I, I do. But do I embody it? Or well, I'm trying. But it's sort of like, okay, if that is the case, if you create your own reality, then everything you see is coming from you. So the only way to change your reality is to change you. You. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, very courageous prayer, isn't it? Like, oh, um, reveal, reveal to me. Oh, my gosh. No, not that. I don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure? Um, and, I, and so, I don't want to have the problem. I just don't want to see what I need to be, what I need to sh- yeah. be shown in order to not have the problem anymore. Well, I mean, there's, and it's, I'd be the same way. If I could have all the change with no change, I'd take it in a heartbeat. Oh yeah. Like, who, who wouldn't take yep. it? And, but however, change requires change. And yes. again, if you want to change what's external to you, it's going to require changing what's within you. And, Again, when you start off with this embodiment, which I always come back to, 
that it's the the learned embodiment through to the natural embodiment yeah and the the learned embodiment is still you're still very much in your head going through it trying to get there the natural embodiment is when you're really there it's like second nature yeah it doesn't mean that you still don't feel the artifacts of where you've been before a bit like you rightly said and what bruno pointed out to me you are a being experiencing being a human being and that's yeah. four beings in one sentence but anyway um <laughs> You're a, you're, a spirit, you're a spirit having a human experience, not a human having a spiritual experience. Yeah. And yeah. so you're not going to get rid of it all. It's not like you you can't get rid of being a human. That'll happen yeah. eventually when you close <laughs> when your we, eyes for the When we time. shed our body, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And it kind of reminds me of this spiritual materialism, right? where mm. people focus so much on accumulating all of the spiritual knowledge and the wisdom and the experiences and silent retreats and possessions and rituals and all this stuff. I'm not going to lie right now. I'm there going, yep, I want that. Yep, 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 <laughs> yep, yep. Oh, that one sounds good. Yep, yep, yep. But neglecting their own personal growth and inner work. And, you know, it's kind of like I, I wear, that, wear a cross necklace, right? And mm. uh, I kind of think... There's a level of self-responsibility here. And, you know, someone might go, this is a really silly example, but I'll demonstrate it. It's kind of like going, oh, no, God protects me. And jumping out of a plane without a parachute. Like at some point there has to be, I have responsibility Mm. to risk assess and make Mm. responsible decisions and steward my resources well Mm. it's like to an extent (laughs) and look don't get me wrong you're going to be protected all the way through the fall (laughs) it's a a sudden stop at the end which is going to be a bit of a a nail biter (laughs) (laughs) absolutely but you know i see this a lot especially in new agey like yeah real new agey spiritual movements where people will be charging their crystals and lining up and doing all these ritualistic things, but not doing their inner work to transcend the chaos that's in their life in the first place. Like stop partnering with demons, stop partnering with these agreements that you have and these binds that you have and actually start to release that and do the inner work, do the personal Mm. growth, do the, the releasing. And then maybe just maybe you don't need to rely so much on the external materialism of spirituality. And look, there's, and if you're only doing it, if basically what you're sort of saying is you have a desire to make a change, but the only change that you make is you buy the right coloured crystal, you do the right ritual at the right time of the month with all of that, then yes, what you're doing is you are anchoring only in the ritual of it. Yeah. But but for, for me, ritual is part of intention setting. Yeah. It is a tool in the toolbox. It is not the only thing. Yes. And so when you combine those rituals and with those things, they're almost like permission slips. Mm-hmm. There's the ability for you to bring in that intention to help you focus your intention. That's what ritual is all about. It's focusing your intention. Um or just another way of of doing it. That combined with being observed, well, observing yourself when you're going through situations, when you're allowing yourself to sort of sit in the mud, to be able to go through those feelings, to look at those sort of traumas and to bring those up or do whatever you are called to do. It's multifaceted. It is yeah. not just reliant on making sure you've got the most expensive and largest crystal co- collection to have the, <laughs> the highest vibe house. I don't understand That's, what's happening. My whole house is made of crystal, but I'm still... Uh, but but definitely don't shy away from it. Like you said, you know, using the devil. I don't believe when you're using rituals in the in the right way, you're not, you're not inviting the devil in. In my mind, any dark entity will, will come in via a permission slip somehow. There's their is, footholds, yeah. absolute footholds. So it's, there's, there's no space for that, but you will learn the most when you are releasing. 
and as these things come in and you clear them out, that's that's growth. Yeah, because it's really, really so big, isn't it? It is, it's and so big. And to be afraid of the dark is is not something that you know that is still fear based. And for for me, the biggest thing that you can come down to every emotion will either come down to baseline love, baseline fear. Yep. And so the more you can appreciate everything from a posture, a heart posture of love, and that includes the dark, Mm -hmm. then you're unflappable until you're flapped. (laughs) And then you realize... And then you go another layer. And you go another level. (laughs) So I had this really interesting experience because absolutely, like I used to be really into crystals. I used to use like tarot cards. I used to be into a whole lot of things. And I wanted to understand um, from a biblical perspective, it warns against those things. And the Bible says God is love. Mm -hmm. And we have identified that there's love versus fear. And one of the things that um, came through to me was almost like distraction. And what I found was that if I was going through a hard time, I would go to my tarot deck not to God because the fear of unknown was so scary that if I had something that could just give me the answer, give me the wisdom, give me the whatever it was, then I felt safe in that unknown because now I knew. And there's, I mean, there's so many, so much to that because then obviously there's open to interpretation and whatever, but, Absolutely. but the interesting thing was where, uh, where was I, the thing that I was convicted of and thing that, the thing that I was um, really challenged by is when that fear comes up, when that struggle comes, where am I turning to? Because mm. if, I'm, if I'm not turning towards source, like if I'm not turning towards love, anything else was coming from fear. And so I had this massive experience in that. And basically from that day onwards, I stopped using anything else because the lesson for me was faith Mm. it's faith versus fear i didn't necessarily need to have the answers i didn't need to have that knowledge and for me that was an element of spiritual bypassing because an aspect of spirituality is faith yeah and look here's here's the thing i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge that last thing that you just said about when you're using tarot cards, it's spiritual bypassing. I want to be very clear, my version of spiritual bypassing. It's mm-hmm. when you believe you're at a higher level than you're actually embodying. That's and an so, element of it, absolutely. Yeah. So when it comes to tarot or astrology or any of those things, again, it's one of those things that when you don't have that faith and at the time you were shown you didn't have the faith. That's why you were turning to the cards. Mm-hmm. Once that lesson was learned, you then made the choice to go with actually the faith of getting that was more important. However, it doesn't mean that you're bypassing when you were using the tarot cards because at that point in time, it was giving you the courage and building you up to the point that you got to be able to learn that faith in itself is enough. And so the, the process or the growth journey isn't bypassing. And I'm just a little bit thinking about that if someone's listening. If, if someone has an Oracle deck or looks on YouTube as a way of soothing themselves when it comes to sort of tarot, you're not bypassing at that point. It's if you are looking at tarot and you believe I have everything within me, I have all faith that I have all the answers, well, actually, no, that's spiritual bypassing. When you believe one thing and you're doing another. But the actual process of using it, it's all a process. Yeah, but I also think there's an element of, um, like I said, deception in that. Because there were so many times where I interpreted what came up in those cards to justify my own lies to myself. <laughs> like, oh, I'm on the right path. Or, oh, I'm doing this or doing that. But it was still going through the same filter of my own mind, which was distorted. So in some ways, like I I can see your perspective and that is absolutely also true for where I was at at that time of my life. But I see the flaw in that 
for me to an extent where there's an element of interpretation that had to come into those things where the, in, the filter system that that was coming through actually I used to justify my own crappy lies to myself like it it, it was <laughs> I look back <laughs> on it I go the things that I justified to myself in the name of like guidance um it was bizarre and, um and here's the thing when you when you're dealing with tarot and you're dealing with energy like that whatever message is coming through and especially when you're watching someone else's because that's that's prevalent that's everywhere you look on youtube you look on tiktok you look at it's if there are people out there doing just collective readings based on what whatever you have to know that what they're interpreting is their message from an energy that they've picked up it's about i think what you're sort of saying is that faith that's a resonance within you that you're doing the right thing yeah and almost that i don't need to know the answers i just need to put one foot in front of the other i need to so again Mm. using the language of holy spirit i just need to attune myself to that and be able to listen and be guided by that Mm. truth as opposed to because sometimes like who's to know I, i got this thing and at the time i was like that makes absolutely no sense what (laughs) I don't get that. And at the time I was kind of like, okay, all right, well, let's just sit on it and see how it unfolds. And then, you know, without having knowledge of how that would happen or the thing that I'm reminded of is that faith is in the unseen and I don't have to know. I just need to trust. Mm. And just like the toe thing, like we continue to pray into that for my son with the bedwetting to have faith means to keep going even if you haven't seen it yet mm. like well it was, it was I mean, quite interesting my my twin sister said to me when she was describing wasn't to me it was i was present in a discussion that she was having with another family member and she goes it's actually believing is seeing it's not seeing is believing yeah and i was yeah. like well, damn, that's exactly right. A hundred percent. And you got to feel it, that sort of resonance. And I guess what people are looking for when it comes to asking an oracle or seeking tarot or looking to the stars, it, they could be looking for answers or they could be looking for reassurance or yeah, it's just part of their journey. They want to see it. Well, it, not necessarily. Just know, just some reassurance I'm on the right path. Some external validation, which is at a... at throughout the journey it can help some people but it's not always going to be the case when you hold on to that for too long and all you do is do a, a tarot reading every day but you don't do anything to try and <laughs> focus on what it is that you're wanting to embody or what it is that you're wanting to to do then you gotta look at it and go okay what am i doing yeah so the, but yes something that i heard once and it's that um it's motion activated. And I really loved that because, you know, even in prayer, I remember when my husband and I had been really praying for a house and we got led to this one house and we were like, I got it independently. I was like, yep, this is, this is where we have to be. And he got, this is where we have to Mm. be. And then the sale fell through right at the last minute, at the very last minute. And we were so devoted. We're like, what? I don't get it. And then we we put an offer on another house and we had the offer accepted. Building and pest inspection came through that was riddled with a live termite infection uh, infestation Mm -hmm. and to get out ASAP. So that's exactly what we did. We, um, We got out of the contract. Within an hour or two of the inspector calling me saying that that house um, to get out of the contract, this house came up on the market. The one you're sitting in. The one I'm sitting in. We came here. The first time I stepped in the door, I was like, this is our home. I know this is my home. And the view that we have and where we're located is one block up the hill and over the fence to where that first house was. 
because it was when we were looking out the the window towards this view that we were like this is this is where we're meant to be this is mm. and so the crazy thing is we we still ended up there it just didn't look like what we thought it was going to look like and that again is kind of like well we didn't know but we trusted that um, that prompting, that sense that we had, and it, it sort of worked out. So it's really cool. Um, Absolutely. And there's no tarot card that says, actually, the house is just down the block. And yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I get it. <laughs> yeah. But there's, so I, I started that with saying that it's motion activated because at the time, a friend of ours um, had been praying for her dream property and she was really upset because um, she was actually, and she was getting really almost angry like i've been so mm. faithful to you god um i've done everything that you've asked for me but where's my house kind of thing mm. and just in conversation i was like well have you been looking on real estate what sort of um like realestate.com have you been going to the inspections like are you registered with the local real estate agents because it was a really specific home that she was looking for and she said no and I was like, but how are you going to find that? Like, how, what? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> Let's just wind back to how you're looking for a house. Yeah. So, but we have to partner with that. Mm. We have to step into that faith and partner with it to be able to see it come to fruition. And so I think that a lot of, regardless of what the context has been, the common thread of what we've spoken about has been... Um, not avoiding, but also taking self-responsibility and taking aligned action towards the goal that we want to achieve. Beautiful. And, and healing really is that, isn't it? It's about aligning, having our mind renewed and then aligning mm. our actions with our intentions and then following through. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, it's sort of, I hear the sort of saying that you need to meet the universe or God halfway. Yeah. Right? It's sort of like I'm going to manifest my dream partner and he or she is going to do this, 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 this and this. Okay, well, look at that list. What are you doing Yeah. with that and that yep. and that and that? Oh, no, if I just manifest it, it will come in. Well, how about you be a vibrational match? What does that look like? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, and look, that's still a challenge for me as well, because I've got my list as well. Um, and I'm still slowly working through my list and go back to last week's episode. I still got to work on one big thing and that's white, but anyway. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, but geez, spiritual bypassing, which is <laughs> so bypassing. Big. There's so much <laughs> more we could have, like, I'm thinking, you know, <sighs> Even relationship conflict, the concept of unconditional love, leaning into this unconditional love and then tolerating things that are just dysfunctional and toxic and unhealthy because of this unconditional love thing. Or Well, so um, the, funny, the funny thing is, and uh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, we've picked up on our next episode um, discussion, right? What is unconditional love? And how can we even get a concept of it in society and and as we are now as human beings yeah because tolerance and unconditional love are two different things yes because in of itself i can love you in your toxicity and still expect more from you and still invite you to rise into function well i mean unconditional love like i'll pose this question with unconditional love in my mind it's actually not a question unconditional acceptance because you accept it for what it is. Because if I love you unconditionally, you can do whatever you, whatever you feel is for you. And you don't, I have no need to change that. And so there's, it's almost like an acceptance piece. Yes. But where does, where does the line get drawn between where acceptance becomes tolerance? So for, for, for an example, yeah, this is going to be another episode. <laughs> Next, next week, next week, next week, next week. The one, um, the one thing that I want to say on that, though, yeah. is like where acceptance becomes tolerance. For instance, you know, I've had uh, people who have um, in by bypassing using that whole unconditional love narrative, 
of stayed in relationships where they were abused and cheated on and really, really you know, had a really negative experience with mm. no boundary, no call to growth, no call for reform, no anything else but they've tolerated it in the name of unconditional love. But in doing so, mm. bypassed the wounding in them that is trying to keep the peace. <gasps> oh, my gosh. Yeah. No, I think, I think <laughs> ne- next week, because there's a lot we could say on that. It's a bit like, um, I'll save it for next week. <laughs> and on that so bombshell... <laughs> Spiritual bypassing versus authentic healing. We'd love to know your thoughts. I just, mm. there's, this is so deep. It's such a big topic. Um, where are you telling yourself that you're okay, that maybe you're not? Mm. What, it, what could you be not looking at because it's too uncomfortable to look at? What could you be distracting yourself with so to not have to look at your own real hard stuff? Where are you offloading responsibility for your own healing without partnering with that and taking aligned action. So and, many questions. And for me, what are you irritated by in <gasps> others at the moment? What theme is going on at the moment <laughs> in others that's really irritating you? Are you doing it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, guys. Bye-bye. See you next week.